Good morning. <clears throat> morning, I've chosen <clears throat> to talk about the scripture is Mark 10, 17. It's the story of the rich young ruler appears in all three of the synoptic gospels. The man's encounter with Jesus occurred immediately after the Lord welcomed little children to his side and encouraged all believers to become as innocent as children if we expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus started on his way, the <clears throat> rich young ruler confronted him. In Mark's retelling, I'm going to paraphrase a bit, the man ran up to Jesus and fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied first with a <clears throat> rhetorical question. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And then he told the man, you know the commandments. Don't murder, steal, or lie about others. Don't commit adultery or fraud. Honor your father and mother. The man considered Jesus' words and interrupted, sure, I've kept all these commandments since I was a little boy. And at this point, I imagine, the man looked at the children around Jesus and went silent. <clears throat> and what the man didn't say is what we often don't say. How can I know for sure? Only Mark described <clears throat> this next detail. Jesus looked at him and loved him. <clears throat> Jesus saw him and he loved him. Jesus was on this man's side. Jesus was pulling for him. Just one thing was standing in the way of the man and eternal life. <clears throat> the man needed to love Jesus back fully. <clears throat> yes, Jesus told him to give away all he owned to the poor and then, become, and then come and follow him. But riches weren't the problem. <clears throat> it was the idolatry in the man's heart. He loved and trusted his stuff more than Jesus, and so the man walked away. Today, as we come to this table, let's examine our hearts. What, if anything, do we love more, trust in more, depend on more than Jesus? Ask the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to help you become as innocent as children, letting go of these encumbrances so that you can fully enter the kingdom of God and the promise of eternal life. We invite all who <clears throat> wear the name of Christian to participate with us. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you today with humble hearts, <clears throat> asking for your guidance and the forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> we pray that we honor you by receiving this communion. In your name I ask this. Amen.
Father God, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here today, Father, and our, our sole purpose in being here this morning, Father, is to worship you, to praise you and to lift you, Father. But it's also, Father, to ask you to reach down and touch our minds and touch our hearts. And as we leave this building today, help us to become the disciples of Christ that you have asked us to become, Father. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Dismiss Children's Church. Well, good morning. I am. Uh, I'm excited to see everybody uh, here this week. <clears throat> but before we get going, I hope that you had an amazing week and that you're ready for today. And uh, as we dive into our new series, misquoted, right? Twisting the Bible out of context. The big idea for this series deals with the fact that it's all too easy to allow our cultural context to blind us to the magnificent, if sometimes hard to swallow, truths of Scripture. Now, I have been sitting on this series for probably close to a year and a half now, just kind of waiting for the right time, and, and felt led, and working on these things, and I cannot tell you um, how excited I am. Because throughout this five-week series, uh, we're going to unpack some of the most prevalent misunderstandings 
about what the Bible has to say um, and, and what Christianity is all about. We're going to tackle some difficult and controversial topics, but always, always with both eyes firmly fixed on what the Bible actually says. So we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing on specific verses, of, although we are going to uh, look at some of these verses and, and some of the ones that are most commonly misused. And this is what's kind of become known as replacement theology. And we're going to unpack that as we go along. You'll have a good understanding of what that is. And the hope is that by the time we reach the end of this series, each of us will have a much more solid understanding of what the Bible says and how it applies to our lives today. So we're going to kick this series off by ripping the Band-Aid off. And we're just going to deal with one of the most dangerous scriptural misunderstandings we face here in the United States. And I like to call it the American Covenant. And I shared this morning uh, in Sunday school, and now to make a little more sense, I can tell you this with almost assurance, that if Paul could see the church in America today, we would be getting a letter. If you don't know what that means, spend some time reading the Pauline epistles, and you will understand a little bit better. Um, if you would, please join me in a word of prayer before we dig in. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we dig into our message today, that every ear is made ready to hear, every mind made ready to understand, and every heart made ready to accept your message for us today. God, may my voice fall to the background and your message come through loud and clear. And God, I pray that as we go through this series that we would understand and apply to our lives what Scripture says, and that we would find freedom there. And so, God, I pray uh, that your spirit would move openly and freely here today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so often, uh, American Christians apply the great covenant promise made in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 uh, to us here in the United States. But that isn't what the Bible's saying. Ezra is not talking to uh, America, right? America is not in a covenant relationship with God. The church is. So I'm going to say that again because I know it's a controversial statement. America is not in a covenant relationship with God. The church is. Now, with that in mind, let's see what Ezra says. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. See, God's covenant promises in Scripture are trustworthy. But understanding where they apply is key. If you are in Christ, you are in the deepest covenant with God that exists. Again, America is not in a covenant relationship with God. The church is. Who is the church? You are the church. I am the church. The people who belong to God is and are the church. I've even heard a pastor refer to 2 Chronicles 7.14 as the John's 3.16 of American civil religion. I cringe when I hear that. Indeed, it would be hard uh, to gather in large groups and attend prayer meetings or Christian conventions sometimes and not hear the promise of this verse invoked uh, somehow or, or some way. Here's the thing. The inclination for it's not inherently bad. After all, our nation is and has always been in need of God's healing grace. But usually this passage is cited as evidence that if we as a nation simply follow the formula laid out in this passage, right, humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways, then God will have to hold up his end of the bargain as well. He will forgive our sins and heal our land. However, those who have been chosen to be his people must cease from their sins, turn from living lives of proud self-centeredness, pray to the Lord, yield their desires to his word and his will. Then and only then will he grant heaven-sent revival 
Is that not what we want in the church today? It's revival. Resounding yes. Yet we treat 2 Chronicles 7.14 like it's a treat for those who behave well. Maybe a, a better way to understand it, and all parents will know what I'm talking about, and those who are, aren't parents always say things like, oh, I'll never do that when I'm a parent. Yes, you will. Uh, we bribe our kids to get better behavior. Even if it, 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 at small things, if you behave well, we'll go get ice cream. Oh, okay. They want ice cream, right? So they behave well. It's a condition thing that we set in place. But that's not what that covenant, as we're talking about, is made. It's not a condition. God's not saying, well, if you do this, I'll do this. The covenant is made for us, not for God. So one of the greatest threats, and hear this well, to the American church, to the church here in the United States, is nationalism. Do not get me wrong. I am a very pr proud combat veteran. I love the fact that I live here in the United States. I come from a family who has served this country for generations. I have served this country in multiple combat zones myself. I have bled and cried for the American flag. I have lost good friends in defense of this country and what it is that we stand for. Some of you know my story. Most of you probably don't, so I want to share a little bit about my experience. I am a combat disabled veteran. I suffer from a traumatic brain injury, a literal broken back. I have broken vertebrae in several places, bulging discs, pinched nerves, all the fun stuff that go along with that. Uh, my knees are about shot. My feet are constantly in pain. I don't, I don't share these things as a, like a prideful moment. I tell you this to lay out what the flag means. Like, I am proud to be an American. However, once I was baptized into a life with Jesus, that is not who I am anymore. Yes, I am proud to be an American, but more than that, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I find my identity in him and who he says I am. I will serve God before anything else. Clearly, it's a good thing for us to want our nation to repent and to seek the face of God. That's not what's at issue here. The crucial question when interpreting this passage is who is Ezra referring to when he says, my people and we? So it's important to understand. The problem arises with the application of the text and other passages to a specific nation outside of Israel. The United States or any other modern nation is not in a covenant relationship with God. Second Chronicles chapter 7 is not a general statement about humblings or blessings, but it points to the gospel. It's important to the covenant itself to see the context in which it was made. This is called the arterial intent. What did the author intend when he wrote this? What is the promise being made? Right. Who are, are they making that promise to in that moment? To whom is the promise being kept? The promise made in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, came on the heels of the completion of the temple by King Solomon. God was promising Israel that because of the covenant he made with them, he would heal their land as they turned toward him in prayer and humility. Clearly, this was not a promise that any other nation in the ancient Near East or today could have claimed for themselves. This was a promise for God's chosen people. So here's the truth. Most often when 2 Chronicles 7 is used in reference to us here in the West, it's not meant to be done in a way that we would be stealing that covenantal blessing from those who the covenant was made with. But that's exactly what's happening it may be completely unintentional, but it's still 100% wrong. It would be like you working really, really hard for something and someone coming in and stealing it from underneath you. Would you be happy with that? Of course not. We would be very unhappy. Then why do we try to do it with the Word of God? So I've got six outlandish ways 
to take credit for someone else's work that I think all of us would agree, like, this is terrible. And I want to share those with you because it was fun looking these things up. Uh, the first one is ask them how they plan on solving problem X right before the meeting. Then say their plan before they get a chance to speak. How about go for a slow stroll by someone's desk when they're away and steal their ideas? Claim them as your own. Repeat a solution someone just said, but add a minuscule detail change and call it yours. How about brainstorm with a group, then viciously object to the best idea another person says, then say the same idea to management as if it was your own. Ask for feedback from your team regarding any new initiative. Take that advice and then fire them. <laughs> if there's a big project, volunteer to co-chair with someone, then avoid all of the work so they have to do it all. Right? All of these examples are uh, unthinkable. No one in here would do any of these things. But in the same way, we can see through the New Testament that God's covenant with Israel is both continued and fulfilled in God's covenant with the church. Again, who is the church? You are the church. I am the church. Those who belong to Christ, that is the church. Now, it wouldn't have made any sense to the early Christians to invoke this covenantal promise for the Roman Empire. It would have made no sense at all. It doesn't make sense for us to invoke it for America today. We must remember that we are the church. This building is not the church. The many denominations found uh, throughout the world, it's not the church. Your favorite preacher, author, speaker, etc., is not more of the church than you are. We are all part of the church. I've got a couple uh, scriptures for you from Paul to help us kind of understand what that means. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. We are the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. See, God's special covenant with Israel has been fulfilled, not by us. It was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, God's new covenant has been made with all who come to him by faith in his name. The great promise includes every tribe and tongue in the world. This great promise is for those in covenant with God, the church. The big C church is the body of Christ that has been brought in to share life with the triune God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Peter says, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. When we lose focus on what the Bible is saying, we end up misinterpreting the word of God through abstracting the promises of God from Jesus. What that means is that we take things like the covenant found in 2 Chronicles 17, or 7, and we apply them to us here in the United States, and uh, we are essentially shadowing the divine purpose of Jesus. Jesus did not come for America. Jesus came for you, and he came for me. He came so the whole world would know his name. If we really believe that the Bible is about Jesus, then we must consistently interpret the Bible through the lenses of of the crucified, risen, and ascended Jesus. Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
A side note here, how awesome would it be to have the Bible explained to you by Jesus? That would be amazing. So let's bring this idea to modernity, to today, to help us better understand what it is that I'm trying to get across. Think of how different pictures look when we add different filters or lenses uh, to our iPhones or to our cameras. Depending on which filter you use or which lens you use, you will get a totally different representation of the exact same picture. All you have to do is change the lens, change the filter, and the picture changes completely. The same way the words uh, on the pages of the Bible can be very differently interpreted depending on the lenses through which we view them. The New Testament is clear, though. The Bible is ultimately about who? Jesus. So I want to reinforce that I am not saying that being a proud American is a bad thing. What I am saying is that the Bible was not written for Americans. It was not written so that we could take bits and pieces of Scripture out of their mint context to support some inflated notion of how godly we are as a nation. Because if you are unaware, we are not. We are so far from godly, it's beyond description nowadays. Which is a bad thing, but also a good thing. The further our world gets from God, the more applicable His Word is for us to share with them. The battle that we face today is a very serious one. It will take a long time to fight. We're going to fight this to the very end. But we must remain steadfast in our charge from Christ, found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told His disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach the new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When we remember what it is that we have been called to do, then we can find strength in the hardest of times. Comfort when all hope seems lost. Remember, you serve an almighty God. The great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings. And I want to begin to wrap up with a quote from uh, one of my favorite modern theologians. It's a guy named N.T. Wright. He said, part of Christian belief is to found, uh, find out what's true about Jesus and let that challenge our culture. See, I, I wanted to end with this quote because there's a great sense of hope found in it when you take it for what it says. What it says is that you do not change the world. What changes the world is the truth of Jesus and who He is. If there was any point that, was, uh, that we as Christians uh, should keep a flame burning bright, it's in regards to missions. If there's anywhere within the call in a Christian life that lukewarmness cannot be tolerated, it is in the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ with a dying world. Church, I want you to hear me loud and clear. Your family, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, everyone you come and encounter with desperately needs you to live your faith out in a way that draws them closer to a covenant relationship with Jesus. The world needs the church, that's you and I, to be the church again. Knowing this, and knowing what we know about the Great Commission from Jesus, should bring us some sense of freedom from the burden of trying to change the world all on our own. Because like Jesus said in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 28, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And this last part, I love. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So when it gets hard, and it's hard sometimes, where do we find our strength? Not in ourselves, but in Christ who has promised us that He is with us even to the end of the age. There is nothing you can go through or face today, tomorrow, or ever long that Jesus is not with you. That covenant that Ezra made all the way back in 2 Chronicles 7, 
is now fulfilled in Christ for who? For you. For me. For those who belong to God. That's who's in a covenant with God now. So in a moment, we're going to close uh, with worship. And as always, I want you to worship God for who he is, what he's done for you, and what he's going to do for you tomorrow and all the days to come. And just freely be in that moment with God. So if you would please join me in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we uh, begin to end our, um, this portion uh, of our worship of you, God, that this is not the end of our worship of you. And God, I pray that as we walk forward from this moment, that we would walk in that covenant relationship with you. And that we would be reminded, no matter how hard it is or how dark it may seem, that we are not alone, that you are with us. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.